Sunshine Governors bipartisan, uh, currently led by Governor Jerry Brown of California and um, Governor Matt Mead of Wyoming. And I'm Bevan Buchheister, and I lead the Water Policy and Learning Network for the National Governors Association. We're on the Center for Best Practices, so we uh, learn about best practices that states are doing all over the country and bring uh, the water policy advisors together for governors to expose them to that and um, you know, teach them about what they, where they can make progress. But I also live in Annapolis, which is a coastal city, and we are the number one city with the number one increased nuisance flooding, according to NOAA, in the country. So this is personal to me as well, and I live in the historic district. I'm Jim McCleskey, I'm director of the DC office for Governor Cooper of North Carolina. I uh, appreciate everybody being with us today, uh, both in person and remotely, and thanks to the ambassador for being here. And uh, Stuart Dorsett, uh, best known as Joe Smith's husband. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm married into Newburgh, and I'm uh, very proud of that, uh, but uh, live in Raleigh now. And on the, on the call, I don't know if we can hear you, actually. Sabrina Bingle says, Joe, no picture, just seeing. We can hear, but it's not clear. So we'll speak slowly. <laughs> but there's no image, you see. No, she sees no image. And who's more on the call? Um, I think we have a list of people on the call. But we can't hear them. We can't hear them and from the conservation community. But we're also videoing this. Um, on my iPhone and if anybody else has a better iPhone great but we will put this up um, on the web and I'm going to revert to uh, where I can see the slides okay um, good so this is like in a post disaster you have to improvise uh, <laughs> and um, at least here in the room everybody can see uh, um, and uh, um, we started a little late, uh, so uh, I have to run a little faster. So forgive me for that. Um, and yesterday we had a, uh, a presentation of the uh, book I wrote, and I, I find a copy here. Uh, and um, it's a book I wrote uh, on my work uh, on the Federal Task Force in the rebuilding after Hurricane Sandy. Um, and the book falls in part in three things, as, uh, or parts. One is my experience. Uh, so part of that is Tintin in America, and, you know, the adventure of moving here with my wife and 16-year-old cat, uh, and finding myself a little bit trapped in federal government, which uh, of course, can be a challenge, uh, and then in a post-disaster world, finding my way forward with the help of Sean Donovan and uh, other colleagues at the, uh, in the administration, uh, uh, organizations on the ground, and then stepping up to the challenge. Uh, Sandy brought us in the region, uh, but also future challenges, uh, developing rebuild by design and working towards its implementation. And the other part, which is the other 50%, that's really half that, are the voices of as many people as we could interview for a half of a book. Because uh, Rebuild by Design and any post disaster, and I would actually say any pre-disaster approach, should be totally inclusive. Uh, so the other half of the book are the voices of communities, uh, people, uh, academic, academics, uh, engineers and designers, mayor, uh, Secretary Donovan and others. Uh, to give their account and their view and their ideas, policy makers, uh, uh, leads of the task force, uh, um, people from foundations, uh, um, uh, to let them talk about what happened post Sandy and how to prepare better, what you know, their capacity, their role, their ideas are, and reflections on uh, rebuild design. And then we have the yellow pages, like the real yellow pages, they guide you through life. Huh? Sometimes you can find anything there. These are the yellow pages that explore a bit why I call the book too big, because I'm not afraid of it, but I, I, uh, eh, we make a point in the book, me and my co-author Yelta, to say that 
uh, the challenges climate change poses on us uh, are too big to ignore. Uh, uh, so uh, we have to face them. Uh, second, they're too big to simplify. And often that happens, of course. We take a siloed approach, a simplified approach. Uh, but actually that fails us in the light of climate change and disaster. So uh, then it's so complex that the current policies and approaches might not fit that future challenge. So we have to find a way uh, to be innovative and uh, creative uh, that doesn't often fit in the current way of doing it. So it's too big for our current system, but it's not too big for us. Um, and it's definitely too big to go do this alone. Uh, so one of the main reasons is uh, 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 join hands, forces, uh, capacity. Uh, um, and uh, last, uh, it needs innovative capacity of design. Uh, so uh, it needs uh, a non-siloed but a comprehensive approach. Uh, so that's what we did last night a bit. Today I start bigger uh, to let you know that you're not alone because uh, the world is facing water challenges. It's not only the east coast of the United States. Uh, and that also means that a lot of communities and governments, businesses, researchers, uh, individuals and organizations grapple with this and find ways forward. So there's a lot of inspiration from around the world, also for places at risk here in the United States and the other way around. Anything you can come up with that can help you deal with these future challenges is of help to the rest of the world. And my role as a water envoy, as an ambassador for water is also to make those connections and eh? find solutions and approaches from somewhere in the world and bring them to other places make a local or regional match and then out of that new invention and intervention or innovation uh, start to replicate uh, these ideas and scale them up uh, it's also always comforting in a way in a time during your challenge eh? your family your uh, 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 you know, the places that are at risk, that you're not alone. Yeah? Uh, and that not only along the east coast of the United States, but also in other places of the world, there are people listening and watching. And I remember personally uh, uh, that when Hurricane Sandy hit, I was up all night with my iPad in the kitchen, uh, 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 talking to friends that experienced Hurricane Sandy, and, and I saw the storm uh, coming. Not, I wasn't there, I was across the ocean, uh, but it was a way to connect. Uh, and right after uh, uh, Sandy uh, uh, and President Obama installed the Hurricane Sandy Task Force, uh, Sean Donovan came over and I toured him around in the Netherlands and showed him how we prepare for an uncertain future. And it inspired us and I sent him this daring email after he left saying, you know, I think, and this is the challenge always, uh, I think Sandy can be a game changer for the US. Yeah? Uh, and never waste a crisis. Uh, and at the same time, you know, that is a tough saying, because with these crises, we lose a lot. Yeah? We lose people, uh, uh, assets, houses, businesses. We lose so much that uh, we've all built up. Uh, uh, and that personal uh, loss uh, might not have a good relationship with never waste a crisis. Yeah? So you have to be very careful in that. On the other hand, if we do waste that crisis, those losses are for nothing. Yeah? If we don't use the crisis as a way to leapfrog and embrace the future and be better prepared, then what we lost was uh, lost for nothing. So we have to learn, uh, uh, get our act together, be bold and daring, while at the same time doing it very, very carefully, very personal, very from the heart. And to not learn a lot uh, uh, from uh, the devastating impact we have on our planet. Uh, not only was there a report from the IPCC, which is the scientific uh, side of the UN FCC, so the UN that works on climate, that explores 
uh, as a question from the UN what the difference is between a 1.5 and a 2 degree world. So a world that is 2 degrees warmer uh, than uh, a post industrial. Uh, um, and um, the 2 degree was actually the 2 degree from the Paris Agreement. So in 2015, the world agreed to act on climate and to say 2 degree is maximum, 1.5 would be better. But that was a political notion, and the UN and the member states and organizations from around the world said, yeah, but what is the difference then? Is it, you know, tell us, eh? is it, you know, what does it mean, half a degree? Eh? Doesn't look like a lot. Eh? Uh, and IPCC, thousands of researchers from around the world worked collaboratively. And don't print a report because I think it's a meter or something. Eh? It's online. Uh, 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 it has a a very nice policy summary you can easily read and it actually tells and the policy summary is, is interesting because it immediately is relevant for everyone uh, but it also resonates a call to action because it says three things one the difference between 1.5 and 2 is massive so this this little sliver of degrees a, ha a half degree is massive uh, in assets that will be lost, so our economy being impacted, but also people. Uh, 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 so people live in vulnerable places, uh, New Bern and uh, other communities uh, all over the world, uh, and we will lose them with this 0.5. So the opportunity of that, if we don't let that happen, yeah, the avoided losses, that's a business case. So that's like a no-brainer. 1.5 is your best bet for people, planet, and economy. Ah. So, uh, second, the uh, researchers said, and it can be done. Eh? Uh, uh, there is an opportunity. Eh? It's not that it's impossible. But then their third uh, conclusion is, but then we have to change everything. Eh? The way we deal with our environment, the world, our energy, our consumption our mo and, and so forth and rapidly and we have no time to waste so there is a window of opportunity if we acknowledge that uh, that we can and that they also believe in the capacity of people to do that eh? we've shown in the past that we're capable of taking these steps eh? uh, giant steps uh, uh, new deal steps you could say eh? uh, I like the the, the Roosevelt resident reference, then uh, it is also a new deal, you could say. Eh? If, this, if we can get to this climate new deal, you know, it will not only save us losses, but it will gain us prosperity, happiness, uh, environmentally sound places that are safe uh, for our children and grandchildren. So that's IPCC. Um, Water is in the middle of climate change. 90% uh, of all natural disasters are water related. So that's like a lot. Uh, and 40% uh, of the world's population in the next decade will be affected by too much water or too little. So 2 billion by too much, another 2 billion by not enough. That means that droughts and floods, storms and rains and sea level rise are increasing because of uh, uh, all the dynamics re in, in, in regards to not only climate change, but also the way we develop, uh, that more and more people will be exposed to those extremes. And already our economy is battered by these, ex these, these water related events. 15% uh, is eaten up. So again, no brainer almost. Uh, avoided loss, 15% of your economy. Hmm. Uh, that would be for any uh, uh, person uh, with a rationale uh, uh, be enough to change. And then uh, it's not only about too much or too little water, it's uh, in, the, in the sense of where do we go or where can we live. It's also the water we use, we need for consumption, uh, uh, our energy and food production. And we often use aquifers, so groundwater. Uh, but then you need to know that around the world, half of the aquifers are past the tipping point. So there's no sustainable situation for them. So that means that 
you know, in the way we care for our planet, we well, care a little less for the water uh, on the planet. Now, uh, uh, this shows an image of a small island in Kiribati uh, in the Pacific. Uh, it's an image by a good friend of mine, Kadir van Lohuizen, uh, World Press Photographer winner. Um, the, the house is gone now. It was the uh, picture was taken a couple of years ago. Um, but it can easily be in, uh, the fight over the drop of water we see in so many places around the world. Now, I'm a water ambassador, um, so there is a reason for that uh, because water is connected to climate, eh? but also to a lot of other issues. So, uh, uh, and it means that water is critical and essential in the way we get to a more sustainable world. Uh, if there's no water, it's women and kids that walk the wells for hours every day. Not only them lacking the opportunity for education and a job, but also taking away an economic prosperity for their community. Eh? Because imagine if the kids could go to school and the women would lead businesses which they normally do in these communities. The prosperities of these places were rapidly leapfrogged. Uh, that they don't have the opportunity because they have to get to work. And the kids can't go to school, so actually it's not only that the current situation is bad, the next situation is even worse. Bringing water actually helps leapfrog these communities and bringing sanitation services helps, especially the girls, to stay in school and progress faster. Uh, uh, so water is a social and equity uh, uh, thing as much as it's about the environment. Uh -huh. Clean water is good for the environment, polluted water is not. Um, and we tend to have not a lot of uh, clean water. Um, so, and water is health. Uh, 5,000 people die every day in Africa only because of health issues directly related to water. And we have food programs, and people are sick and they get more food and they still die uh, because the water is contaminated. Over 2 billion people in the world drink water that is not fit for drinking. So that is a, a challenge, uh, while at the same time, if we manage water right eh, on all scales, if we value it across the board and if we understand this complexity, the three main recommendations coming from the high level panel on water, then water can be an asset, eh, can be a leverage for sustainability, uh, for prosperity, uh, uh, for achieving the goals we set with the sustainable development goals, but also leverage in the context of dealing with the impacts of climate change. Now, I already said that climate, the weather is getting more extreme. Wet places get wetter, dry places get drier. Um, and floods are everywhere. So uh, I issued a research, we presented it this summer. You can find it online. It's called the Geography of Future Water Challenges. It looks at the world and again tells you you're not alone. And if you look at the right, the image on the right top slide, aside of the slide, you see that every country has a flood. Eh? It's very democratic. Eh? It's not that only uh, uh, Europe or the United States are, you know, get floods. Every country has floods. You know, some a little more than others, but if you, if you look at the map, you know, it's, it's pretty okay. Eh? Eh? Floods are everywhere. Uh, they're daily nuisance, you could almost say. Uh, but if you look at the right down image, the image on the right downside, those are the people that are affected by those things. And all of a sudden it's not so democratic because only Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, is hit hardest eh, compared to all these other places where people are uh, suffering. So when Harvey hit Houston, for instance, that same week, uh, floods battered Nepal, Bangladesh and India, uh, killing 1200 people. So that's the difference. We, less space in the world. Uh, vulnerability is not only physical vulnerability, it's also human vulnerability. And there is more human vulnerability in other places. So if we think about solution, eh, a lot of people elsewhere will benefit too. Now, people flee because of climate change of too little or too much. Um, uh, I will skip this, but we urbanize. Uh, also something to consider, uh, especially also here in the United States. Um, and mankind has this crazy thing of urbanizing in the 
uh, most scary places eh? <laughs> yeah. where it's vulnerable we like to live and I come from the Netherlands so I you know I couldn't agree more that in the place that is below sea level we earn you know 70 to 80 percent of our, uh, our economy uh, and it, it's also because these places are prosperous eh? uh, deltas rivering eh? from the past those were the places of connectivity but the soil is amazing uh, this is where we can you know uh, go everywhere we can grow any crop so uh, these are the places not only of risk but also of opportunity eh? risk and opportunity always have a close relationship uh, but if we look ahead um, uh, that, uh, that places um, that growth of urbanization 50% eh? of the world lives in cities over 50% 75 in the next decade uh, but the increase in urbanization in deltas and on our coast and rivers is moving faster than the, the average of urbanization. So there is more increase of urbanization in vulnerable places when it comes to flooding. That's, that's not only interesting, it also poses an economic challenge or financial challenge, you could say. It's because uh, OECD and the World Bank calculated that there's a all losses global uh, lead in flood damage uh, will add up to a trillion a year in 2050. It's a lot of money. Yeah? So mm. you could easily say, let's not make that happen. I mean, we can, if we can avoid this, uh, we can invest a trillion more in our economy and our environment and so forth. Yeah. So the avoided loss, if you take that into account, is a, is a reason to adapt and mitigate that is uh, clear. And if you look at the, the world, of assets at risk, so a financial economic perspective, you see that there are three regions in the world that are at risk. Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, with uh, Gangju, uh, Hong Kong, and other cities. Uh, east coast of the United States, uh, and this is asset, so if you, New Bern will be, not be on the list because it's a small city, but New York and Miami, of course, are there. Miami tops the list, $278 billion. Uh, and the third region is the Netherlands. So uh, we have something in common. Eh? Uh, the Netherlands, East Coast and Asia uh, at risk. Uh, and uh, Amsterdam is number nine, but Rotterdam is number 12. If you add that up, we're number four or, uh, of the list of the world's uh, asset at risk. Uh, so being a small country, we do count. <laughs> it's not the list you want to lead. Um, <laughs> so, um, uh, it's not that we're in there to beat Miami in this case, uh, uh, but uh, it, you know, it makes, makes the opportunity to connect. Uh, but if you look at Africa, you see no uh, red circles popping up, while Africa will have doubled in 2050, because this is only a financial perspective. It's not a humanitarian perspective. Uh, and there's inequality when it comes to floods because vulnerable uh, people live in the most vulnerable places. And it's not only that they're hit harder by floods and disasters and storms, or, but also droughts. It's also that they, because of that, have a harder time to get back on their feet. So it's uh, increasing inequality and uh, 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 inequity. So disasters and risks actually uh, become bigger in those places that are vulnerable. When it comes to how do you survive, you know, how do you respond, survive, and recoup after a disaster? When there's enough money to rebuild, you move faster ahead. Uh, I'm not saying more sustainable, but at least you can move faster than when there's not. So vulnerability, there's more vulnerability, uh, and recovery is tougher there. Now, um, Tuesday morning, we had a 30-minute delay. And now uh, Hank Oven comes in and tells you all the bad stuff. Uh, I guess you need coffee and warm apple pie or something. Uh, but uh, uh, there, is a, there is a good side to the challenge. And I'm an optimistic uh, person. Uh, I travel the world. I'm on a different continent almost every week. I was in Vietnam last week and will be in uh, Asia again next week. Um, and uh, I do believe that our if we work together, uh, there are opportunities. But I also need to tell you that the challenges are big and that the need to act on those challenges 
uh, uh, is also essential and critical. Eh? Uh, so it's not to scare you, uh, but it is to remind you that we should not ignore this gender. Yeah? This is not something that will go away. It's not that something that you could say, I'll sleep another night and the nightmare is over or the bad dream. Um, it is for our kids. Eh? And I'm not talking about our grandchildren. Children that play the streets today will see the year 2100. Looks, you know, far, I won't see the year 2100. Uh, you probably won't see the year 2100. But our kids, and definitely our grandchildren will. That can be a planet that is four degrees hotter. Or 1.5. And that choice is a collective choice. Right? So the urgency comes with the challenge. Uh, uh, so we can do something to mitigate those risks. That is the opportunity, and that is what I believe in, and which is great, because it brings people together from different backgrounds, from all over the world, but also in their community, with different ideas and different challenges and different visions on the world, but working on this as an opportunity, not as a scare, but as an opportunity, is the way forward. Now, the World Economic Forum, which is the collective of businesses, but also some NGOs and government, it, it comes from the private sector, uh, every year presents a report that tells us what the risks are. Uh, and it adds them up, and it said in 2015, water for the next decade is the number one global risk. Too much and too little and polluted water, in a way, impacts our lives. But there is more, eh? extreme weather, climate change, or the failure of us to mitigate and adapt biodiversity loss, uh, environmental catastrophes, food crises, and so forth. And so it tells us that the urgency is increasing. And the impact of these disasters and the frequency uh, and the amount is increasing. So it's more and worse. This is like, I made the, the bad joke yesterday. You say it's like you bring your daughter to bed or a grandchild and you say, did you have a good day? And he or she would say, yeah, mommy or puppy or grandfather or grandma. And you think, are oh, you better? Because eh? tomorrow is worse. Eh? The moment eh? you think that this should be your reminder that eh? tomorrow should not be worse, it should be better. But there's an opportunity. And eh? the World Economic Forum Risk Report on the left side tells us the future is challenging, but on the right it says there is a clear interdependency, interlinkages between these risks. Eh? Social, environmental, economic, cultural, ecological. Uh, uh, Crises are related. So if we come up with more comprehensive approaches in mitigating and adapting these risks, we will be able to redo these risks and turn them into opportunity. So forget silos, but start to cut across. Uh, forget individual approaches, but start to collaborate. And the moment we become more comprehensive and inclusive, the better we are in preparing ourselves for the uncertain <coughs> future, and actually mitigate the effects, the impacts of what we're already doing and mitigate the way we are developing in this world. And that type of collaboration, that type of inclusivity, that type of a comprehensive approach is critically important. But if we do, the risks go down and the opportunities go up and economic prosperity looms. So it's real, eh? it's not a fairy tale. We can do this. Um, and for that, a perspective has to change. Now, if you 